Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Martin Kölling. I'm the moderator of today. And it is my, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the former vice chair of uh, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change here at the club. Climate change is a topic that is hot everywhere, also in Japan, but in my home continent, uh, Europe, it's even hotter because we are facing droughts already for several years in many countries, in my hometown, in my home country, Germany, as well as in Spain, France, and in Italy. There are huge droughts, yeah, dried lakes and rivers. Here in Japan, we still have enough rain, so maybe that's why so many people are not so afraid at the moment and not so uh, don't feel such a don't feel don't seem to feel a sense of crisis but uh, today we have uh, Jean Paul van Hyper I hope I pronounce this correctly Jean pa Jean Pascal van Hyperzeel he is uh, he was speaking at a um, event of the EU about climate change but he is also in Japan to present his candidacy for the IPCC chair uh, and um, yeah, he's making some advertisement here in Japan for himself. I don't know who the other candidates are. Maybe you can fill us in about that. So without further ado, I would like to open uh, the floor to you. But before that, I would also like to uh, remind everybody to switch your cell phones off or to silent mode out of courtesy to our guests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your, your presence, uh, both those who are in the room and those who are watching on, online. Um, I try to give um, a general introduction to, to, to climate change uh, on the basis of uh, the latest IPCC uh, report, which is the sixth uh, assessment report the IPCC has published since uh, 1990, when the first report was published. And I will indeed end by saying a few words about my candidacy, but that's not the main subject of the uh, uh, talk today, and I'll be happy to uh, answer your questions uh, after all, after my speech. So I'll try not to speak too long. I will uh, start actually with a summary, a summary in ten words of the situation. And the, ten, the first two words are: it's real. Uh, I think it's very hard now to um, deny that climate change is happening in the world. There are so many uh, extreme events of all kinds related to climate change happening, uh, that uh, the fact that climate is changing at all human time scale uh, is now uh, extremely clear. The second couple of words uh, is it's us, because the human responsibility through the um, emissions of greenhouse gases, mostly CO2 coming from the burning of uh, coal, oil, and gas, and also coming from deforestation, is recognized now as the main cause of the climate disruption which we are seeing in the world. The next couple of words is that experts agree. You know, the experts uh, that are assembled by IPCC in particular, IPCC being the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I had the honor to be vice chair of between 2008 and 2015, uh, really built over the years a consensus uh, about the understanding uh, that uh, indeed humans uh, are the main cause of the uh, warming that we are seeing. The fourth couple of words is, it's bad. It's bad because the impacts in the world are starting to becoming ser really serious, both on people, on people's health, on people's wallets, because it costs uh, to see infrastructure destroyed, home lost, uh, etc. But also uh, impacts on ecosystems, uh, which are maybe a little less visible but which are quite important because all human well-being depends to a large extent, whether it's for food or for pleasure, um, uh, on uh, the well-being of those uh, ecosystems. The last two words are probably the most important. There is hope. 
There is hope because, as the IPCC has demonstrated over the years, there are plenty of solutions uh, to the problem that's on the table. I didn't bring the IPCC reports uh, on paper with me. That would be too heavy <laughs> uh, because the last report, when printed, is about this thick, 10,000 pages. Uh, but I would guess that about half, if not a little more even, of those 10,000 pages are actually made of elements of solutions to the climate change uh, problem, both in the area of adaptation to the part of climate change which is there already, as um, in the area of mitigation, prevention of further climate change through reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I'd like to start maybe with uh, a slide uh, to give us, uh, to give me at least, um, uh, some sense of humility. This is a picture taken by a satellite orbiting planet Saturn 10 years ago, half, uh, a billion and a half, um, a billion 500 million kilometers away from the Earth. And you see the beautiful rings of Saturn, but you also see that small dots there with an arrow. And this small dot, and it's blue actually, if you could see the color, this small dot is our planet. And it gives a sense of where we are in the universe, where we are in the solar system. Very isolated, very vulnerable, not too close to the sun like Venus is, plus 500 degrees C. Not too far from the sun like, for example, Saturn, minus, two deg 200, uh, minus 200 degrees C. We are just at the right distance. We have a wonderful atmosphere which we are using as a dumping site for our air pollution and our greenhouse gases. When I landed in Tokyo two days ago, a few minutes before landing, I saw this beautiful landscape. And I learned from the map on the um, plane that this was the um, prefecture of Shizuoka, where actually the uh, Activities of Honda started in the uh, year 50s, at the end of the 40s. And why do I show this? Because this is one of the um, examples of uh, a vulnerable uh, portion of Japan, the country we are in, uh, namely a coastal region, a coastal region which is densely uh, populated with a lot of humans living there, but also a lot of infrastructure, uh, which costs billions to build over the years. And with sea level rise, and I will talk a little more about sea level rise in the coming decades and centuries, uh, all coastal regions of the world, including this one, um, uh, is threatened. And this sea level rise is accompanying climate change. So this is... Um, Actually, um, uh, an animated diagram, which I should have uh, been able to show you the animated version. I made a mistake. I put the uh, non-animated version here. Sorry about that. But what you can see is on the left, uh, the evolution uh, over time uh, between the center towards the exterior of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. You have the months of the year around the circle. And uh, you see that it started where the blue um, uh, center, the blue zone, is um, presented. It started in 1850 with a value of 280 parts per million. And uh, we are now uh, at 200. Yesterday, we were at, two, at 424 parts per million. That's a little more than 50% uh, over the initial value. And actually, uh, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, it's over the past two days, uh, for the first time in human history, uh, the value of uh, 424 ppm was crossed. That value has never been higher. And it will still increase in the coming few days, because typically, uh, during a typical year, the maximum is reached around mid-May, so it will still increase uh, for a few weeks. Uh, before going down seasonally and then go up again at a higher point next year. 
And on the right, you see the evolution over the same time period. And I'm sorry, this is not animated, but uh, when you'll have the slides, you'll have the link at the bottom of the slide, which you can click on, and then you'll see the animated version, um, which shows the evolution over the same period, 1850 to now, of the global temperature average. And this um, increase in temperature uh, is of the order globally of 1.1 degree Celsius. We are not very far from a very thin, and I'll try to show you, do you see my mouse here? Um, a, a very thin red line which is there. This, this red line shows the 1.5 degree C limit which I wear of my, on my tie here, because it's a very important number uh, coming out of the uh, Paris Agreement. It's actually the most ambitious target of the Paris Agreement, uh, to try to stay, namely to try to stay below that level of warming, not to cross that level of warming, because beyond that level, the impacts would become significantly more severe than below that level. And, uh, if you were able to see the animated version, you would see that both the concentration on the left and the temperature on the right evolve in parallel. Now, it's not because they evolve in parallel that you can conclude um, uh, as simply as that, that one is the cause of the other. But there are many scientific reasons, which I will not explain here, uh, why now uh, scientists are convinced uh, that there is a very, very solid basis to say that, yes, indeed, it is the uh, evolution of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and uh, the concentration of the other greenhouse gases, which also play a role, less important than CO2, but uh, also warming uh, the planet, which is the main cause of the warming observed since the middle of the 20th century. This is another way to look at the, the evolution of the concentration. It, this shows here uh, the last, sorry, it's not the last 10,000 years, it's the last 2,000 years. Um, and you see that for the last 2,000 years, this concentration has been pretty stable until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, 18th, 19th century. And then it exploded uh, over the last 200 years, reaching the value I mentioned yesterday. The value was 424.03 parts per million. And that was uh, essentially the first time in human history. Now, the acronym IPCC has been mentioned several times already. A few words on the IPCC. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which was created by the UN, the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, and UNEP, uh, on the basis of a resolution uh, from the uh, UN General Assembly in 1988. UNEP is the uh, United Nations Environment Program. Uh, to provide policy makers and decision makers of all kinds, and uh, I must say citizens of the planet, um, the, the most objective source of information about everything related to climate change, the processes, the causes, the possible evolution in the future, but also the potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts of climate change and the elements, uh, the, the possible response solutions, the element of solutions uh, in the, uh, the area of both adaptation and uh, mitigation. The impacts of climate change are there already. Uh, the two categories of impacts, and I'll say a few more words about those in a minute, that are the most visible in the world are extreme heat, um, periods, uh, because extreme heat period become with the warming, with the average global warming, uh, they become more frequent and also more intense. Uh, the second um, category of extreme events uh, is heavy rainfall, and uh, it's uh, observed in the world that rainfall in many parts of the world becomes more intense. And when rainfall becomes more intense, and it becomes more intense because a warmer air can contain more uh, water vapor, and therefore the rain can be more intense when it rains, um, 
this as um, this leads uh, to um, potentially more floods uh, when it happens because the, the 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 rain is very concentrated in time. But paradoxically, paradox, paradoxically, um, you you also have in some parts of the world more droughts. Uh, at some point, for example, in the southern part of Europe at the moment, uh, or in the um, uh, some parts of Africa, you have uh, an increase uh, in the um, intensity of droughts. Uh, fire weather, the, the conditions for big uh, forest fires uh, are becoming uh, more frequent as well. Look at uh, Australia, look at uh, California, for example, in the recent past, look at the southern part of Europe, uh, this is becoming uh, more, um, sorry, the, my computer is uh, <laughs> decided to transcript uh, what I'm saying. I'll ask him to stop. Uh, um, and then finally, uh, there are impacts in the ocean. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is uh, five illustrative um, examples. But in the ocean, you have the combined effect of warming uh, which is not good for many uh, aspects of ocean life, and acidification, because uh, the ocean is absorbing a fraction of the CO2 we are emitting, and this CO2 absorbed by the ocean um, is acidifying the water, and uh, at the same time, uh, the amount of oxygen uh, dissolved in the, the water is lower because uh, of the increased uh, temperature. So hot extremes uh, are more uh, intense, more frequent, heavy precipitation uh, as well. And um, those hot extremes have, uh, in particular, effects on, on health. Heat waves kill, uh, particularly if the high temperature is combined with high humidity. Because when it's combined with high humidity, our body cannot perspire, cannot lose heat by transpiration and we have a difficulty to maintain our metabolism temperature, which is essential for our well-being. Uh, intense precipitation, uh, as I mentioned, uh, have consequences for uh, the intensity or the frequency uh, of floods. And this is just an example in my own country, in a region called Wallonia, uh, where in the summer of uh, 2021, and actually the same storm, uh, which delivered huge amounts, at least by uh, European standards, of rain uh, in a few hours, uh, also moved to Germany and uh, produced similar um, damage. Um, it's, uh, the, the result uh, of, of those floods were, in Belgium, 40 uh, people lost their life, and it's uh, billions of euros uh, uh, of damage uh, that uh, followed. Now, let's look at the future. Uh, to look at the future, the IPCC is working with scenarios. And these are the five main scenarios in terms of emissions of CO2, at least, considered by the IPCC for the next 100 years. You see there's a blue scenario, which is uh, the lowest, the very lowest one. Uh, its name ends with 1.9. And then there's a very high scenario with a name ending with 8.5. At the top, that scenario has emissions which are three times as large uh, as the, um, em the uh, emissions of today, uh, while the lowest scenario has uh, net emissions that are zero by the middle of the cen this century and um, negative emissions, so it means more absorption than emission, uh, after the middle of the century. If you feed those scenarios uh, to climate models, this is what you get. And uh, actually, some of those um, computations, some of those uh, modeling efforts were made in Japan. And I'd like to pay a tribute to the Japanese scientists who contributed uh, over the years to climate research, including Suki Manabe, who received the uh, Nobel uh, Prize of Physics together with Klaus Hasselmann from Germany uh, last uh, October. Uh, so when you feed those five scenarios, this is what you get for this century. The very lowest scenario is able to stabilize the temperature uh, slightly below 1.5 degrees C. So it would succeed if we were on that scenario to respect the uh, objective um, of the uh, Paris Agreement, while the top scenario uh, is totally out of bounds with a uh, temperature increase close to 5 degrees by the end of the century and still increasing 
uh, later. Of course, these are average numbers. If you look at the spatial distribution in the world, this is what you, what you see. And you see that uh, the temperature is actually increasing much more over continents in general than over oceans because of the thermal inertia. So you have to remember uh, then with, when a global number is given, you have to uh, multiply that number by a certain factor if you're talking about uh, values over continents, particularly when you move closer to the uh, uh, polar regions. Now, let's look at sea level, mentioned at the very beginning of my, my speech, as one of the um, major impacts threatening Japan, for example. Uh, and these are the results um, of the projections for the five scenarios I've shown for sea level. So basically, it's an increase by the end of the century uh, somewhere between 50 centimeters, half a meter, and one meter over the present, um, the present uh, value, let's say, or the, the value at the beginning of the, um, the, century, the 20th century, rather. But there is um, a low likelihood, but this uh, low likelihood event would have high impacts, as you can imagine, that instead of one meter uh, by the end of the century and still increasing later, you would have close to two meters if some part of the Antarctic ice sheet in particular would become unstable because of the warming. And there is that possibility. But uh, it is not a certainty, it's a possibility. Uh, scientists are unsure about whether this would happen and with which probability, but um, it's clearly a risk uh, that we are taking, that we would be taking, uh, if we were staying on high scenarios in the coming uh, decades. And you can imagine what the effects would be uh, on the bay I've shown, uh, I've shown earlier, and uh, on actually on all coastal regions around Japan in particular, uh, if that happened. Now let's look at um, a little further, because very often the numbers are given for 2100, but for sea level, it's a very long-term issue. Let's look at the numbers which are also given in the IPCC report for 2300, just a little later. You might think, oh, 2300, I'll be dead. Yeah, of course, but maybe not uh, small children of our small children and of our small children. And if you move around uh, Tokyo, you'll see plenty of very nice buildings and cultural um, uh, events uh, and um, uh, uh, structures which are way older than 300 years, actually. So 300 years is still a human time scale. And look, uh, for the, um, it's not the very lowest scenario, but it's for a low scenario, uh, you would have uh, here somewhere between half a meter and three meter for the 2.6 scenario. So it's not the lowest scenario, it's the scenario just above. Uh, because the, the very lowest scenario has not been run until 2300. That's why it's not given. And then for the top scenario, it's between two and seven meters. Between two and seven meters, but with a small remark, which is unreadable here. But it, this unreadable remark is very important. So I blew it up here. And this is what's written here in very small letters. Sea level rise greater than 15 meter, that's 1.5, it's not 1.5. It's not 15 centimeters, it's 15 meters. 15 meters cannot be ruled out with high emissions. So again, think about the bay I've shown uh, at the beginning of my speech, uh, the, my window uh, picture, with plus 15 meters in 300 years from now. Uh, that's quite, uh, that would be quite an impact. So there, there are uh, every reasons uh, to maintain uh, the temperature um, increase below 1.5 degrees C uh, because it would uh, help uh, the sea level rise to be maintained be below those very high value as well. Now, future cli global climate risks, well, they are very similar to what we have started to observe already. Uh, it's, um, they would be expressed in terms of heat stress, of water scarcity, of food security, of increased flood risk. Um, now, if we want to avoid going above 1.5 degrees C, which the IPCC report just uh, finalized a month ago, uh, as far as its synthesis report is concerned, at least, um, says it's possible, I repeat, 
If you want to stabilize the warming under 1.5 degrees C, which the IPCC report says it's possible, you have to um, uh, shape down the uh, evolution of the um, uh, global emissions, the global net emissions of CO2 in the way shown there. Uh, and again, uh, this shows you need to reach the net zero point globally around 2050. You, need, you see it's an approximate date. Uh, for some simulations, it's even earlier. For some others, it's later. So let's take 2050 uh, as uh, the average. Um, now, is this going to be achieved? It's, it's uh, one of the uh, essential targets of the Paris Agreement. Okay, it's the most ambitious target of the Paris Agreement. But if you take all the national plans, in the jargon they're called the NDCs, um, that were submitted by all countries of the world, or almost all countries of the world, in the framework of the Paris Agreement, uh, this is what you see. Uh, this is a diagram from 2016. I'm fully aware of that. It has been updated since by the Secretariat of the uh, Convention. I'm fully aware of that. But I like the graphical <laughs> presentation uh, used here much uh, more uh, than the more recent uh, diagrams, which actually show essentially the same, because if it's by a fraction of a millimeter uh, that uh, the changes uh, would be. So it's not exactly the present situation, but um, this is much clearer, uh, I find. So what do you see? You see the, the um, business as usual emission curve uh, until 2030, 2030 is here, uh, is shown in orange. Uh, the green curve shows what would be needed uh, to respect the 1.5 target. The blue curve uh, to be below 2 degrees C, which is a less ambitious target, which, by the way, is not uh, contained in the Paris Agreement, because the Paris Agreement doesn't speak about staying below 2 degrees C. It speaks about staying well below 2 degrees C, which is not the same. OK, but you have a sense of what we need to, where we need to be. And those two rectangles here, this rectangle for 2025, this rectangle for 2030, show and show with some uncertainty, as you can see, where if you aggregate all the pl national plans in the world uh, as far as emission reductions are concerned, we would be in 2025 and 2030 if, if all those plans were implemented. And OK, it's, it's a little better to be here. Let's say the best estimated is this dotted white line here. It's a little better to be here or there than to be on the orange uh, curve, but it's very far still uh, from uh, the green and the, uh, uh, even the yellow, uh, the, the, blue, uh, the blue trajectory. Okay, two minutes. Okay, I, uh, three minutes? No, five minutes. Five minutes, okay, thank you. So how can this be uh, achieved? Because there, there was hope, uh, um, both in the title of my speech and in the summary in 10 words, so I need Still, I cannot stop here. Mm. I, uh, it's, it's good that I have five more minutes, because otherwise you will be all possibly depressed by my depiction of the severity of the situation. But there is hope, and I'd like to explain why uh, in those remaining five minutes. Because the third volume of the IPCC deals with mitigation. A key message of this volume is that unless there are immediate, and you know what immediate means, it's not in 2030, it's tomorrow morning, uh, if not tonight, and deep emission reductions across all sectors, all sectors, 1.5 degrees C is beyond reach. But, but it's conditional. So you can read the sentence the other way around. It means if there are immediate and deep emission reductions across all sectors, the 1.5 degrees C is within reach. Okay, I prefer to read it that way. I mean, you can read it both ways. So, how to do it, and I don't have the time in five minutes, to, you know, probably four now, uh, to, to cover all the details, of course. But the report is very clear, and it's 3,000 pages thick, approximately, um, to uh, say and to discuss and to assess all the options available now, and now is in bold letters on this uh, diagram, uh, in every sector, 
that can at least halve emissions by 2030, which is, which is needed. Actually, what is needed is to halve emissions every 10 years until 2050, uh, where we get all close to zero. Um, and those sectors are energy, land use, industry, urban areas, buildings, transport. And then there's a cross-cutting theme, which uh, the IPCC presented as very important, and that is demand management and reduction in demand sufficiency, uh, you know, re reducing uh, wastage, uh, etc. Uh, and that can be applied across all sectors. Just uh, very quickly, uh, the slides on energy, uh, where major transitions are required to limit global warming, using a lot more um, uh, renewable energy and uh, low carbon um, uh, energy sources. The good news is that the price, for example, of photovoltaics and wind energy and also of batteries has an uh, extraordinary decrease over the last uh, 20 years, making them competitive uh, with fossil fuel. Demand and services uh, across the sectors have the potential to bring down global emissions by 40 to 70 percent compared to the business as usual trajectory by 2050. Um, buildings can be much better insulated to reduce uh, their energy needs or uh, much better conceived so that in warm climates the cooling demand of those buildings is much lower. Uh, industry can use materials much more efficiently, uh, can, can uh, work in a much more circular way, uh, etc. Um, technology and innovation, of course, play a very important role. Since you have a printed copy of my slides, you can read all the, the words I'm uh, skipping to uh, uh, stay within my time. But of course, technology and innovation is a key part of the solutions, as well as policies, regulatory and economic instruments to steer the economy, to steer the behavior of economic actors, but also of citizens in uh, the right direction. And all this, says the IPCC, is better done in the framework of the Agenda 2030 adopted by the UN the same year as the um, uh, Paris Agreement, the 17 Sustainable De Development Goals, because when that is done, there are many synergies that can be captured between climate action and uh, the other uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So humanity has the choice now. Uh, the choice to, to stay on a high emission scenario, and then you'll see the result on the right, uh, or to be on a low emission scenario, which won't be perfect. There will be impacts both on people and ecosystems, but the situation will be more, much better, particularly if adaptation takes place sufficiently. And we have the choice uh, of uh, achieving that. And I want, uh, if I'm elected uh, chair of IPCC, uh, to facilitate uh, that choice and uh, provide policymakers uh, with the, um, uh, the best information, the best connection between what science provides in terms of information, and when I say science, it's in a very broad way, uh, and the needs of policymakers. I also want the IPCC to be the voice of a party which doesn't speak in the climate negotiation, that's climate itself. The climate system doesn't speak, uh, doesn't have a seat in the climate negotiations, and I want the IPCC to be the voice of climate, the voice of climate science uh, in the best manner. And I want to do all of this, and then I close, uh, in the most inclusive way uh, so that uh, everybody feels respected in IPCC, uh, so that the participation of developing countries, of women, of young scientists is uh, maximized in the operation of the IPCC. Um, and if we do that, I believe that the IPCC will respond better uh, to the future, the present and the future needs uh, of the uh, Climate Convention and policymakers uh, in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. And the first website there is the website where you'll be able to find this presentation and you'll have the colors which you don't have on your printed version in the course of tomorrow uh, if everything goes well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, I will open the floor to questions. I already have two online questions. Let's start with them. One question by Dennis Normile, Science Magazine. 
there now seems to be a general recognition that climate change is real. However, one objection to cutting CO2 emissions aggressively is that doing so will impose unacceptable economic costs. What do you say to this objection? Okay, well, you know, I'll answer on the basis of the IPCC report. I'm not an economist, um, but I've worked with economists uh, during my career. Um, of course, to cut uh, CO2 emissions costs, but uh, it also brings, um, I mean, it's, it's an investment. An investment costs always at the beginning, but it delivers uh, benefits uh, over the years. Um, of course, investing requires uh, some money at the beginning, but if your energy bills, for example, uh, are significantly reduced because instead of buying fossil fuels, which are non-renewable, uh, you have invested in renewable energy systems to capture uh, either the sun or the wind, uh, uh, which then, when the um, investment is made, uh, essentially delivered uh, uh, freely, uh, you will, over the years, uh, actually earn money. So, I mean, maybe what I said is a little too, too simple, but still, it's a key element of what we are talking about. Another key element is that the impacts of climate change also costs, uh, whether they cost in terms of human life, in terms of cost to infrastructure, uh, or in terms of uh, cost to ecosystems, uh, which are hard to monetize, by the way, but which are very real. And maybe those costs um, in different um, kind of uh, exchange have not been taken into account sufficiently uh, because when one look only at the cost of reducing emissions and not looking at the uh, benefits in terms of avoid damages, well, you are missing you know, the, other the other phase of the coin. So yes, uh, cutting CO2 um, costs, but it's an investment uh, that can reap a lot of uh, benefits mm. too. And Dennis has another question. One contentious issue is that climate change is increasing inequality. inequality. Can the world find a way to balance the costs of reducing emissions among both developed countries and developing, developing countries? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a key aspect uh, of the, uh, the climate question today. And this is exactly why uh, I've put uh, on my campaign postcards and in my program those key elements, uh, which are also part of the context uh, of what we need to do, uh, both uh, in IPCC and in the climate negotiations. Namely, I think, to broaden a little bit our perspectives, and not only to look at climate change, but also to look at some of the other problems uh, the, which exist in the world, some of which are indeed uh, poverty, inequalities, uh, the biodiversity crisis, injustice, etc., cetera, um, which are addressed uh, by several other sustainable development goals than SDG 13, which is climate action. Uh, that's remark number one, but also the two other principles I have in my program and which I think need to, to be taken on board much more, uh, both in the climate negotiations and in IPCC overall, uh, are the principle of climate justice and the principle of um, just transition, or fair transition. You know, we have a transition to organize. Now we, are still, we still have our foot on the accelerator uh, pedal, if I can use that analogy, using a car, which uh, uh, we should not uh, use too much uh, if we want to protect climate, at least if it's a thermal engine car. Uh, so we still have our foot on the, uh, on the accelerating pedal as far as emissions are concerned, because the emissions are still increasing year after year. We need, as I've shown, to reduce those emissions. So actually, we need to move our foot from the right side to the middle side, to the brake, because we need to reduce emissions as quickly as possible. It's a transition. That transition from the right to the middle needs to be done in a fair manner, in a just manner. Because if it's not done in a just manner, you have what happened in France a few years ago with the yellow vest, the gilet jaune. Uh, because some of the measures we, which were taken then didn't take into account the social effects 
of the of of the uh, that the measures the measures would have on people. So it's very important, you know, to broaden perspectives. And instead of you know thinking about climate on Monday, on uh, poverty on Tuesday, and biodiversity on Wednesday, is instead to think every day of the week. Uh, at um, the uh, synergies uh, that can arise when you consider the different problems together. And if we do that, I think we will move forward much better. Mm -hmm. um, before I open the floor to questions, uh, I have a few questions myself. Um, I didn't attend uh, the G7 uh, ministers meet, uh, environment and energy ministers meeting in Sapporo, but I uh, watched uh, the uh, press conference and uh, read their report. The G7, even the G7 couldn't agree on a end of coal firing and gas firing. Uh, they could agree basically to end the unabated fossil fuel use, which, which is, I think, the untreated fossil fuel use, right? Um, we, we it means without capture and uh, without capture, uh, without, capture and with, storage. without carbon capture and storage. So, what do you think of um, basically the food dragging in, of the G7 in this regard? You know, the, the IPCC uh, has no mandate to assign uh, good uh, good points and bad points to to any country. And uh, if I am the chair of IPCC. Uh, I, I will certainly uh, have to be very careful not doing that, so I will not start today. But um, <clears throat> you know, in, in general, um, what most countries, uh, uh, if not all countries, uh, have done up to now is uh, very insufficient. Uh, so I, I could say that uh, whatever the details uh, are in the um, uh, G7 conclusion or the conclusion of uh, COP27, and I can take the risk of already saying that I would probably be able to say that after uh, COP28 as concluded, that yes, it was a step forward um, in the right direction, because it's certainly better to speak about the need to, um, um, you know, move out of certain fossil fuels uh, within some time than not to say it. It's a small step forward, but it's a, a step forward which is way too small and too slow. And that is the common, it's the common feature of um, all the measures, almost all the measures which have been taken uh, until now, um, both at the international level and in basically all countries in the world. So we need much more, um, a, a much larger sense of urgency and much um, uh, stronger leadership and political will uh, to do much more to protect what is our only home. I mean, we don't have another place to, uh, uh, to go to in the solar system. Yes, something they can go to Mars, but that's maybe one or two people, and I, I, I don't wish to, co to go with them because it will be very uncomfortable uh, in terms of conditions. Um, so, yeah, the, the, uh, we need to do much more, and everybody mm -hmm. needs to do much more, including the G7. Mm -hmm. Here in Japan, um, the Japanese government also promotes heavily... Um, Hydrogen, the hydrogen society, uh, including the uh, use of ammonia, for example, as a, uh, as fuel for thermal power plants. Uh, from a climate perspective, if this is basically green ammonia, uh, does it make sense? Well, you know, there there is um, in the um, uh, mitigation. Um, in the mitigation, and this is the mitigation summary for policymaker, uh, there's a very interesting uh, table, um, uh, which is uh, table uh, SPM7, uh, which you might have seen, uh, showing uh, the um, uh, potential contribution of uh, a number of different technologies in different sectors by 2030. Um, and if you see if you see the length of those contributions, uh, which are the number of gigatons per year that those uh, different technologies can reduce uh, the emissions uh, by in 2030, and you also see uh, I realize this is uh, small for those who are online, uh, but you also see colors 
Uh, and I will add those slides to the presentation. I, I'll, I'll have a slide with this. I'll, I'll add it in, in the, um, the one I'll put online after. You have colors here. And uh, you see that um, the two largest contributions there in the top are mostly in blue. The colors are related to the cost, but the cost of implementing those technologies by ton of CO2 avoided. What are the two uh, top technologies there? The first one is wind energy. The second one is solar energy. Um, at first sight, I don't see um, ammonia here, but there is uh, some contribution for f fuel switching in industry, which has some significant contribution, but it's mostly yellow and red, so with a significant uh, cost, uh, while blue here means negative cost over uh, for much of the uh, contribution here, for, for much of, of the contribution here. So what does it mean uh, in, in clear terms, maybe? Uh, because without the slide, maybe it's confusing. Sorry about that. Uh, that there are many uh, elements of solutions, including many uh, technological uh, elements of solutions. But some uh, have a much larger potential than others. Some are much cheaper than others. And probably it would make sense to prioritize uh, those who don't cost um, as much um, over a life cycle, uh, at least, which is the way these computations are made. So I'm not an expert at all in ammonia, uh, and I have no idea of the cost of those uh, uh, techniques, but um, it, it's, it, it, must, it must be checked whether it's really indeed uh, the best option also economically. But mm -hmm. we won't solve the climate problem by using one single technology. We won't solve the climate problem by using only windmills or only solar energy. We, in any case, we will need a, a mix of different uh, technology, different elements of solutions. We will need uh, energy storage as well, uh, which um, is important for renewable energy in particular because of the uh, intermittent nature. And um, it's only by combining all those elements of solutions, including maybe some of those, that we will address the uh, issue totally. Mm -hmm. Maybe if somebody wants from the floor. Yeah. Please introduce yourself by name and affiliation. Takuya Nishimura with Hokkaido Shimbun Press. Thank you for the presentation. And I think one of the uh, controversial talking points in terms of re reducing the greenhouse emissions is taking advantage of nuclear power plant. So uh, we have a news from Germany that the country finished the nuclear power generation while the Finland uh, had, a, had a decision to make new nuclear power plant in uh, in that land. So the Japanese government is, is recently uh, expanding the use of nuclear power, nuclear power plant in the uh, energy plan uh, for the future. So what do you think, what is your assessment for the uh, significance of using nuclear power uh, for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not going to give you my answer because uh, the IPCC, again, in this table, has given a very interesting answer. Uh, nuclear energy is here, and you'll be able, since I will add this slide in the presentation, you'll be able to see yourself. So nuclear energy is here. So it, there is a, a potential contribution, and this is at global level, okay? This is the, uh, uh, an estimate uh, at the global level. So the contribution by 2030, if I read well, uh, is um, a little smaller than one gigaton of CO2, the potential contribution of nuclear energy uh, by 2030 is a little smaller than a reduction of one gigaton of CO2 equivalent per year. So it's significant, it is not nothing. You cannot say um, using nuclear energy doesn't contribute uh, to reducing uh, CO2 emissions. Now, the IPCC 
uh, also discusses and mentions, because it's reflected in the literature, all the uh, other environmental aspects related to nuclear energy. I mean, there are a number of issues uh, in terms of uh, um, radioactivity, uh, waste management, etc. But in terms of um, climate, uh, this is the contribution. So it is not uh, negligible, but it is not very high either. And the other uh, remark one, one can make looking at this is that the portion that's in blue, and remember blue means uh, the cost is um, lower, I'm, I'm reading here, lower than the, the reference, lower than the business as usual uh, behavior, is actually very small. What is that cost? It's essentially when existing nuclear plants are extended in their life, because it doesn't cost very much. Uh, to keep an existing nuclear plant lower, longer. What is very expensive, and actually increasingly expensive, in part after Fukushima, but also after Three Mile Island earlier in the US, and, and Chernobyl in 86 in, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, is that uh, the costs of building new nuclear plants with increasing safety measures, etc., has been such that, yes, indeed, you can uh, produce electricity with very little uh, CO2 using nuclear power, but it requires huge investments. Now, when you think about the curves I've shown earlier on the reducing costs of uh, solar energy and wind energy, for example, well, at some point, you have to um, stand back a little bit and, and reflect, does it make sense economically still to invest in nuclear energy? And the answer in many countries is uh, no. Today, um, renewable energy is, is cheaper, or efficiency measures uh, to reduce the demand. Because the, the cleanest energy is actually not the energy produced by solar energy, windmills, or, or nuclear energy. The cleanest energy is the energy you don't need is the energy you don't use, is the energy you don't waste. That's the cleanest energy. And there are so many measures to uh, you know, decrease the amount of energy needed uh, to provide an equivalent level of service uh, that if that was prioritized, maybe the questions about nuclear energy in many parts of the world would um, um, be less um, frequent. Okay, here's another question from Dennis Normal. Many advanced countries have shrinking populations, Japan among them. Will this help to reduce CO2 emissions? Well, it happens that um, I worked at the beginning of, um, uh, of my career uh, with demographers to look at uh, the uh, role of population growth on um, uh, the um, evolution of CO2 emissions. And um, what we concluded then, and it's a, a paper published 30 years ago uh, in 93, uh, was that uh, you don't need to look only at, at the evolution of population, but also at the combination of um, population growth or population evolution and uh, the, emission per cap the emissions per capita. And since, uh, at least until recently, most of the uh, increase in the population was uh, taking place in developing countries where the uh, uh, levels of emissions per capita were very low, actually the effect of uh, population growth in those countries uh, was uh, smaller, relatively, uh, than the uh, increase in consumption per capita and therefore emissions per capita in many developed countries. Uh, now, if it's the developed countries' population uh, which decrease, uh, this logically would probably, but it needs to be investigated, and I don't think that there are many papers about that already, but logically, it would suggest uh, that it would indeed uh, contribute to some decrease uh, of the emissions in developed countries because the multiplier is usually so high in developed countries. So if the 
high emitters are less numerous, this will have an effect on the emissions of those countries to a certain extent because you decrease the population but the infrastructure remains the same uh, and some emissions are related to the existing infrastructure. So it needs to be investigated but I am relatively confident that it would have an effect uh, in terms of reduction of emissions in developed countries, yes. So if there's no other question, you have another question? Hmm? Um, then I will maybe ask the last question. You mentioned um, developing countries already and the per capita emissions. Um, wealth plays a role as well, I guess, in um, emission production in a way. Or um, so with the, um, what role does poverty or, or the growing um, growing middle class and then development uh, play in climate change? Well, the main role poverty, to, to take the first part of your question, plays is in terms of um, uh, increasing uh, for those people living in poverty the vulnerability. Because people living in poverty who don't have access to um, energy, they don't have access to an air conditioner uh, with uh, electricity if there's a heat wave. They don't have access to a health system and a social security system. They don't have access to clean water. Uh, they don't have access to, um, uh, to, to um, basic you know, well-being services. They are much more vulnerable to the same um, climate effects than those who are not in poverty. So I would say the main relationship between poverty and climate change is that poverty is a big amplifier of uh, the vulnerability to climate change. It is certainly not um, uh, a cause of emissions because on the contrary, those who are poor, they emit very little. You know, the whole of Africa, which is not very rich on average uh, globally, is contributing 4% of the globe 4% of the global emissions today. That's a very small, a very small amount. So um, I think in the coming years, we, 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 we have to, um, um, again, I mean, look at the um, SDGs in, the, in, the, in a holistic way. And SDG 1, uh, the, the red there, the top of the uh, thing, is, is to eliminate poverty. Um, and if, if we don't, and if we keep uh, having increasing gradients of, um, of um, wealth between people at the surface of the planet, with uh, uh, people emitting huge quantities of uh, not only CO2 and other gases, but also other kinds of pollution, and others living in poverty and uh, extreme poverty sometimes, and being extremely vulnerable uh, to the effect of climate change, at some point, you'll have, you know, gradients which have become so so high, differences which are becoming so high uh, between uh, those two poles that you'll have sparks. You know, in electricity, when you have a, a, big, a big difference of potential between two poles, you have sparks between. Um, when you have gradients in physics, that's what happen, uh, that's what happening. Uh, there's a, a flow between uh, the two positions with a big difference. So I think for so many reasons, uh, we need to move towards a, a world where there is less poverty, uh, less inequal inequalities, and more justice, including climate justice. Okay, thank you very much. I think that was a good statement, good final statement. Thank you very much, and now I will close the session. Thank, thank you. you.